The socio-economic rights and accountability project Sereb has urged the International Criminal Court to launch investigation into Nigeria's pre-election violence. According to the body, if the situation is not addressed, it might lead to post-election aggression. The group urged the ICC officials to urgently send a legal team to Nigeria to promote free and fair elections to collate potential proofs of election-related violence before, during and after the general elections. Joining us to discuss this and more is Oluwadari Kolawale. He is the dire Deputy Director of SEREP. Thank you so much, Mr. Oluwadari, for joining us. Good evening. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's interesting because I just finished talking with um, the, a representative of the Labour Party um, here in Lagos who was also um, uh, talking about the experience that they had during the uh, last rally that was held here in Lagos. We saw videos, pictures. I'm not sure if you did. If you are on social media, then you must have seen those videos and pictures reportedly um, of people who were attacked on the day of the rally. Now, this is not the first time we're seeing pictures like this. It might not have been the Labour Party in the case of Zamfara State um, or in the case of um, Kaduna State. And we've seen pockets of violence. We've seen also how convoys of presidential candidates have been attacked uh, and several other issues. Um, let's start by looking at what's at the core of these violence that we've had. Uh, many people would say that this Nigeria has had a history of election violence and it's not going to stop today. Do you agree? Yes, I, I agree that the electoral violence that we've seen over the years appears to be escalating this year. But that's not surprising, both in the scale and the manner in which this uh, violence is happening. Uh, it is true that we've had a rather long history of electoral violence, right from the onset of, uh, right from independence and this uh, democracy in 1999. But what makes these attacks more brazen and possibly more worrisome is the scale at which these uh, violence is growing. And the cause, is, the cause of this kind of violence is it's not far-fetched, really. We can have remote causes and immediate causes. We cannot have governance on the basis of impunity that despite the rule of law and respect uh, elections to be violence-free. So elections being a very critical part of the democratic process happens once in four years, apart from the off-cycle election that I make uh, conduct. So what do we expect? When the various institutions, public institutions do not function like they should, because they are either underfunded, riddled by corruption, or just uh, inefficient by reason of impunity. So what do you expect? So uh, the violence that we've seen is not because we do not have public institutions that can prevent these attacks or that can bring the perpetrators book to book. It is because the absence of political will to make these public institutions function in the first place is absent. It is quite lacking. And so the public institutions cannot do their jobs. If we have issues and challenges with having quality affordable education, we have issues with health, we have issues with every public sector uh, institution that you can think of. What do you think will make the ele elections an exception? So rather than appeal to the morality of people to be law-abiding, which is very important, by the way, what should be done and what should have been done is to equip the public institutions that can't prevent violence and that can't stop violence to function like they should. Uh, these things just, uh, they just don't happen in a day, unfortunately. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in any way saying that violence is good and I'm not in any way promoting violence, but you're telling people to be law-abiding, but then the people who are supposed to be leading them are not necessarily law-abiding. Um, so who's going to stop who from, you know, going about it the violent way? Because you see, a lot of people are getting away with murder in quotes, and I'm using the word murder loosely here, um, and nothing really is done about it. We hear a lot of statements being issued and then the police will talk tough but nobody's docked. Nobody's used to set an example. So who's going to stop the people who are, one way or the other, backing or overzealously supporting these people who, one way or the other, either through the rhetorics or um, through their body language, are encouraging the violence? Exactly. When we have public leaders uh, who cannot lead by example, whose utterances demino and actions for the past four years uh, exudes impunity and disdain for the rule of law. We do not set a good precedent for, for followers to follow. But much more importantly, 
these publications that should function effectively cannot function. And this is not the absence of public institutions of laws that has empowered these institutions. For instance, a major provision of the Electoral Act 2022 empowers INEC, that's Section 145, to prosecute all the electoral offenses in the Electoral Act 2022. And the Electoral Act, there are many, and lots of these violence fall within the context of the electoral the, uh, of the criminal offenses in the Electoral Act. For instance, Section 116 and Section 128, these pockets of violence that we've seen that are growing, by the way, fall squarely within what can be called electoral offenses. And they're also offenses by the criminal code law of various states. So the question is, what has the police and all the law enforcement agencies who have the power to arrest, investigate, and prosecute. What have they been doing? What has INEC done up to this moment? We've seen nothing done because the pervasive atmosphere of impunity and the absence of adherence to the rule of law is playing itself out. Only, the only difference is in this instance, it is that of electoral violence. And that is why we feel so strongly as a group in SERA that the International Criminal Court Court must step in at this time by reason of the uh, by reason of the prosecutorial powers and investigative powers of the court to prevent the violence which we've seen at the pre-election stage from escalating to further violence during the elections and post elections. We've seen this happen not only in Nigeria but in other African countries, and there is a good precedent for this. We've seen this happen in Cote d'Ivoire. We've seen this happen in Kenya, and we've seen the role that the International Criminal Court has played. And that is why we are very optimistic that the court will help to prevent the growing violence as we approach the 2023 elections, which is just 24 or 13 days away, and to ensure that during the elections there is no violence, and if perhaps we see people who perpetrate acts of violence, the International Criminal Court can activate its jurisdictions by gathering the much needed evidence to prosecute such individuals. So this means, if I'm not uh, wrong, it means that we have, one way or the other, exed our own courts within the land, saying that they might not necessarily um, have a balance of judgment to deal with this issue. This is what it means because we're always quick to either go to the ECOWAS or go to the ICC on cases like this when our courts have one way or the other failed. So can we say that our judiciary has failed in terms of um, making sure that the right kind of judgments are passed on these issues? Or should we blame, again, the government? Because the judiciary has this clear-cut job and there's supposed to be a check or a balance of sorts between the judiciary, the legislative, and of course, the legislature, I beg your pardon, and um, you know the executive. But then when you look at the executive and the legislature, these are all made up of politicians. So where this is where the courts come in. And with judgments such as the one that we saw um, over uh, the last weekend um, that has allowed for the Senate president to be running for, uh, an office where he did not participate in the primaries, can we fully say that the judiciary in Nigeria has failed? Uh, we cannot blame the judiciary in this instance, either for the acts of electoral violence that we've seen or for not, uh, for not stemming the tide of the violence. In this instance, the law is very clear. Uh, the police and other law enforcement agencies are critical members of the executive. The police should investigate. They have the statutory powers to do so under the Constitution and the Police Act. They have the powers of arrest, and naturally, arrest and investigation, or investigation and arrest, will ultimately bring those uh, who are culpable before the court. That is when the powers of the judiciary uh, can be activated. But what we have seen and why we've taken this step as Sarah is part of what is called the complementarity principle in international law. It means that the International Criminal Court can assume jurisdiction in this instance because Nigeria as the state party to the Rome Statute has either refused, cannot, or does not, or is rather unwilling to take steps to bring the perpetrators of this electoral violence, which we see clearly are crimes against humanity, to bring them uh, to face justice. And that is why we have written to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to activate the jurisdiction of the International Court, uh, International Criminal Court in this instance, to investigate. It is very important to understand the mechanisms of the International Criminal Court. It has investigative powers and it has prosecutory powers as it were. So what we've done by this petition is to activate the investigative powers 
of the International Criminal Court, that is the prosecutor. The office of the prosecutor is distinct and separate. So what he will do in this instance is to ask permission of the trial chambers to commence an investigation. And that means visiting Nigeria pre, before the elections, during the elections and post the elections to ensure that it prevents growing violence and to ensure that they gather the much needed evidence to ensure that those who carry out acts of violence are prosecuted. But in this instance, the executive arm of government by the law enforcement agencies had refused to even act in the first place to arrest them, uh, to investigate them, and to bring them before the courts. So we cannot blame the judiciary in this instance. This is squarely the fault of government, but much more noticeably, the fault of the executive arm of government, which we think can be repaired by the International Criminal Court. So we're, fo we're solely putting this at the feet of the government, and you're saying that they failure to act, failure to prosecute, but who's holding their foot to the fire, aside from Serap, who's, who else is holding the foot of government to the fire? But let, let's keep that on the side. You made mention of the examples of the DRC and Kenya. I, I was recently in Kenya and um, I, I had a talk with the, um, the head of the electoral um, commission there. And it, it, it's, it's interesting that we have observers and monitors who go to these countries. I mean, the last Kenyan election was a success. Many were surprised that um, there was not the violence that they expect every other cycle of the elections in Kenya. And you know how it's been uh, between the supporters of Raila Odinga and, of course, the sitting president. But that was a different scenario this year. And I did speak to him about what the key thing was. Uh, that helped them to stem the tide of violence. If we have former heads of government being uh, serving as observers and monitors of these elections, who know, who have understood the me mechanisms that have been used, why is it so difficult for us to borrow a lift from it? Is it that we do not know or we have chosen not to go that route? Uh, thank you very much. I think the national as the uh, former president would help for them to come to an objective assessment of whether the elections are free and fair. But this does not on its own prevent election, uh, violent pre the elections that we've witnessed in Nigeria presently or during the elections. What that will do is they will be able to give an objective assessment as uh, external stakeholders in Nigeria to give an objective assessment of whether the elections are free and fair. What that can also do to a government that is responsible is that knowing that there are international observers and other stakeholders who are actively watching, it should make government to wake up more to its responsibilities to ensure that Nigeria is seen as a pillar of democracy. And that is one of the effects of having international observers in the country. But with the uh, unwillingness of the Nigerian government to act now pre the elections, how can we be so sure that this same government will act to prevent this act of violence during the elections and after the elections? It is very important to see the key role that the International Criminal Court played in the instance of Cote d'Ivoire in 2010 and in Kenya in 2007 and 2009. It held a long way uh, to stem the tide of violence, not in that particular elections, but in the subsequent elections, mm -hmm. which is why we think if that happens now, it will help prevent what could be a serious problem, more particularly since the crimes against humanity, they are happening now. And they are growing, growing at an alarming rate, just 12 days or so to the elections. We need need to act now. Uh, we need to have the international community intervene in the way that we've spoken of, not only as observers that we've spoken, but activated jurisdiction of an important institution like the International Criminal Court will help to prevent the violence and to ensure that those who, are, who have plans to do so, if they intend to carry that out, will face justice ultimately. Um, I'm going to use the old saying that prevention is better than cure. Now, the prosecution and, and, and the investigation of the criminal courts is obviously to gather evidence and see if we can have a case against the people who have perpetrated these violence. But what can we do in the interim to try to reduce the level? Because it's the same question I asked my previous guest. Um, like I said earlier on, um, take for example, at some point, the deputy governor of Lagos State made a statement about a sudden presidential candidate who was campaigning in Lagos, telling him to go back to where he came from and campaign there. Um, and these are certain things that obviously one way or the other 
could cause certain people who are overzealous to, you know, be violent. We've also seen governors using their powers to um, either shut down um, campaign offices, um, order destructions of billboards, um, you know, um, even put, shut down campaigns totally in their states because they have the power. So how do we make sure that these people, because I mean, they know they have the power, they're in charge, so they can do whatever they like. But then um, in the interim, how do we make sure that these people uh, do not one way or the other, other overuse these powers that they have? Uh, to cause violence, because I'm guessing if this violence is beneficial to these people who are causing it, then they, who's going to stop them? If it's beneficial, then they're never going to get in the way of making it stop, right? So how do we, what do we do in the interim? Other than going to court, how do we make sure that people can <coughs> want to come out on election day and vote? Unfortunately, uh, this is one of uh, the various drawbacks, the negative effects of impunity and the lack of adherence to the rule of law. That is what we are seeing playing out now. And that is why we have left with more or less moral persuasion to those who are perpetrating this act, particularly those who are in positions of power, those who are in public office. And it need not be so. Like, like I've mentioned, the laws are there. The public institutions that should prevent and ensure that people follow the law, they are there. But there has been a consistent habit of impunity. Government does not obey the judgments of court. Judgment, government does not follow due process. A rule of law is not adhered to. So we are at a crossroads. We are approaching elections. Violence is happening. Nothing is being done. So we are left with persuading. Make arguments by way of moral persuasion. I had a meeting today, for instance, with the major with the political parties to try to um, ensure that they commit uh, to some sort of peace accord. While that is laudable, that needs not be the major approach to ensure that the violence doesn't happen. We have the law. The electoral act is clear as to how political parties must conduct really parties. The question is clear about what is the, the What is the essence of a peace accord? We're not at war, are we? We're just having pockets of violence. So should we not be looking at something other than a peace accord? Because if you ask me, it's one of those routine things that we do before elections, which does not in any way hold water. So what do we need it for? Exactly. And we need to learn a lesson to ensure that good governance, good governance is not about, it's not only about providing infrastructure. It means following due process. What does the law say? And then to follow them. And that is the point I'm making, that we are left with, rather call it uh, mundane or artificial steps, we might call it kinetic steps, which is this kind of meetings where I neck with these political parties. It is good, don't get me wrong, but those are not the key things that should be done. Violence has been happening. Individuals have been identified. You mentioned instances in this in this regard. Why can't the police, why can't INEC take steps to activate its investigative and prosecutorial prosecutor powers to ensure that pe these people are brought to justice? But what have we seen? Nothing has been done. So people get emboldened to commit unlawful acts when they know clearly it is a crime. And those who have seen other people do it and get away with it continue to do it. And so we can see a growing level of violence, not because the elections are around the corner, mind you. It is because these acts of impunity have been on for a long time. So what we can only do as a solution is to ensure that these public institutions are able to do their work. The laws are very clear. Like I mentioned earlier, the electoral act is very clear as to how a political party should conduct its campaigns. Okay. The constitution is clear as to the powers of a governor, as a public officer, what he or she can do or cannot do. Okay. So why can't these public institutions, who should hold these uh, officers to work, why can't they do their work? That should be the point of advocacy now, okay. to ensure that we prevail on government to follow the law and make sure that these public institutions work. The police okay. must arrest those who have been seen and been found uh, to have committed or incited acts of violence. Okay. They should uh, bring this before the courts, for the courts to do, their, to do their job, to ensure that they face justice. Until we do that, this is likely to escalate, and the consequences, uh, they are not good for anyone, which is why we've taken that step to ensure that the International Criminal Court steps in now 
to prevent the growing violence. For in other countries that we've seen violence escalate, particularly in Africa, it started with a spark, such as these small, uh, these small pockets of violence. And we need to stop it now as we approach the elections. Well, let's hope that uh, there is a start now, especially with the um, DSS or the, the police um, inviting uh, one of the spokespersons of the um, leading police, um, the APC, um, for statements that, he, that were credited to him about a cool plot. Let's hope that that will be a start and hopefully we will be able to hold a lot of people's feet to the fire. Kolawele Luwadari is the Deputy Director of SERP. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that's it on Plus Politics tonight. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget, elections are very, very important and they have consequences. Make sure that you're ready to vote come February 25. My name is Mary Anacon. Have a good evening. Thank you.